Community Teamwork is an organization that has been uh, based here in Lowell since 1965. Um, we're a community action agency, which means we were started on the war on poverty and with the Great Society legislation in the Johnson administration. So we have a long history and we were started to fight poverty, to uh, give people a voice in the decisions that affect their lives and to change our communities. So we've grown from just being a community action agency to we are also a regional housing agency and we're a community development corporation. So we operate many programs that assist people um, moving to self-sufficiency um, and that impact our communities. To be a nonprofit agency, in this case a community action agency around for 60 years, is significant. And I happen to be a person who believes in celebrating milestones and we are celebrating our 60 years uh, as a community action agency. Um, and we're taking a look back at our history and we're looking at what we did then and where we've come from, how we've changed or not changed, and uh, looking to, uh, you know, for new avenues for work at CTI. The Economic Opportunity Act, that's what created agencies like ours. It goes back to Sergeant Shriver, who was, as you may know, uh, brother-in-law of President Kennedy, was asked to do something about poverty in America. And he did a lot of research and he came up with, these are things that we could be doing. And one of the things we have to do is to get low-income people empowered to help themselves. So they created this idea of community action and community action agencies that would find low-income people, get them organized into groups, figure out what they wanted, and have them have a say in how the programs actually worked. For example, in Lowell, what we did was we had a staff of, I think, nine or ten community organizers who would go to the various neighborhoods and set up little neighborhood councils. So that, and then the, the people there would decide this is the kind of program that we want here and we can do it. For example, one of the first ones was a well baby clinic. So, and we partnered with Lowell General Hospital and they would provide medical assistance so that people could bring their young children and get, a, you know, have them checked out and that kind of thing. Where, because most of those people didn't have a doctor that they could just go to. So. That was kind of, that was, I think, one of the, you know, a good, a good program for starting out. Uh, and then we, we just kept adding programs as we could find them, and, uh, and it worked pretty well. When the program was started in 1965, I was a single parent with five children receiving AFDC funds, which is welfare. And the program was geared to children of low income families. So they started with those children. And I had my fourth child was, was of age. So they came and asked me about enrolling him in the program. And then they asked me to be a mother's aide, which we, we, which we were, to help the teachers. And that's, that's how I started in 1965. We started with two classrooms, two at the um, elementary school in Tewksbury. And, and this is just my town in Tewksbury. It also happened all over the land, you know. And, um, and then we had five summer programs. And then it became, after five summers, it became um, a school year program and remained a school year program. We were granted a, money, a lot of money to create a skill center to help low-income people learn, learn job skills. Uh, and we had uh, enough money to rent a space in an old mill building, I think, and we created workshops. There was a carpentry workshop. There was an automotive workshop, which had a, a lift for the cars to go up and down so, and some other. And, and then we also had a whole section where uh, people could learn typing and, and later on, of course, computers. 
so that there were clerical jobs coming out of there. There were automotive and carpentry kind of workers. When we first started, wherever we were housed, we did our own maintenance. Everything was done by the teachers and the teacher aide in the classroom. Everything. And nobody complained because that's the way it was, you know. But we did, we painted, and we built things, and we picked up things along the road and refurbished them. And it was fun, though. It was great. It was really great. We had a large Head Start program. Head Start was for preschool kids, right? And we had used churches, church basements, schools, you know, anywhere we could find a, a, enough size for a classroom. And they were all spread all over the place. And it was not as um, efficient as it could be. And our Head Start director at the time, Jim Hilaris, had this thought. If we just had one big space <laughs> that we could put everybody in. And we were able to uh, find the funding to acquire the building on Phoenix Avenue, which had been an industrial or a office building of some kind, and convert it into uh, a, a bunch of classrooms. I forget how many now, but there's probably 30 or 40 classrooms in there plus other space for gyms and, you know, activities, playgrounds outside. It just was, a, and I think to me it was like a turning point at CTI where you're saying now we, ha we have much more control over our future if we can do this kind of thing. So now we, we have our own building, which was wonderful, all in one place. That was a highlight, really was. The, by, by statute, by uh, f rules of our funding uh, and how we were established, it's called a tripartite board. There are, there are three groups. There's a low-income group. It's supposed to be equally divided. Low-income representing public officials and the third representing the community. And uh, it needs to be balanced. And, but if it's imbalanced at all, it must be imbalanced on the side of low-income representation because that's really what it's all about. It's an anti-poverty agency. So the idea was to have the low-income people on the board be able to talk directly to government people, you know, city councilors or whatever, and to the other parts of the, of the community so that everyone understood what was needed and could move forward. I can tell you, everyone that is on this board today and the people who were on when I came on in 1992 are committed to the mission. That's the number one thing. It, you have to fulfill the legal requirements, but the most important thing is the heart, your heart, has to be connected to the mission of community teamwork. And uh, I think we've been very lucky that we've had that all along, but this board is particularly uh, dedicated to it. I came to CTI, interestingly enough, is right out of graduate school, and I thought, I'll work at Community Teamwork for a few years, and I was hired to be the child care coordinator, and we had 40 children in child care. And we also had a Head Start program, but that was the part of the world I worked in. I had four kids, I got married, and pretty soon um, I found myself in a situation where I was a single parent. So I had four kids under the age of six, and realized that if I wanted to continue my career, I needed childcare. Um, I had a master's degree. I'd gone through school. I had lots of uh, uh, family support and lots of community support. Um, but what I didn't have was someone to take care of my kids at a price that I could afford. So I enrolled my child where I worked at Community Teamwork. And that helped me um, be able to move forward in my life. It was the one thing that I needed. And, it enabled me to keep my house and to uh, keep my kids in the same school and to do all the things that I know are important for children and stability. So I think early on I had a really deep understanding of what stability and housing means to a family and what it means to not have stable housing. So I kind of very quickly became committed to the work we do, to the mission, and the passion of the people I worked with and found a home at Community Teamwork. I've worked in about five different jobs there. I became the, the head of the childcare component, 
and then the chief program officer, and then 20 years ago, I was promoted to the uh, chief executive officer. And I will soon be retiring, so it's a very interesting time to look back on why this work has been so important to me. And part of it's because of the work we do and the programs we provide. The other part is because I also learned you have to work on policy and you have to work with government and had a great opportunities to do those things to really impact the policies that affect people's lives. Well, the fundamental, a fundamental change was when I came on in 1992, the overall income, I won't call it the budget, but the money that came in was like 27, 28 million dollars. I would say today it's 150 million or more. Now that, that's basically the contracts that you have with, with um, various federal agencies, whether it's it was through fuel assistance or WIC or the housing vouchers and so on. That's a tremendous change. And it was, it was that way for a long time and then it just moved. Now, granted, COVID, the, the crisis, financial crisis in 2008 um, made an agency like ours uh, eligible for a lot more money because we're dealing with the, the, the fallout uh, in housing and fuel assistance and so on. So you've got more money for the federal government uh, to help you because the federal government doesn't usually directly help its citizens, its agencies like community teamwork, um, you know, that implement what the government wants and what the government needs. So I'd say just kind of blatantly the financials. And the other big thing is that um, when you go into a community with like, this kind of money is that, that I was talking about, and the elected officials in a government don't have any say over it, there's a conflict. Because if you're an elected official, you feel as if people have elected you to watch over these monies and so on. But the federal government didn't want that. They wanted the money in the hands of the people in the community of Lowell or Drake or Tewksbury or uh, Chumsford. And they wanted, uh, uh, they wanted people that they chose to be making the decisions. And that's why you have a board and, and, and so on. Um, so it was a struggle. It was, there were real clashes in the 60s and the 70s. And you know, personalities get into it. In the last 20 years, we've had a really solid, um, highly regarded executive director and senior staff. And so what I see is a big change in the relationship with the government. There's a trust level now with the local governments. There is um, a partnership. And also when money comes into a community and you've got a lot of nonprofit agencies, there's some competition for that. And there always was, 60s and 70s, even into the 80s, a competition. Now again, I see partnerships. I think that's one of the biggest things that we pride ourselves on as an agency, over and above what we do for our clients, is that we work in partnership. And if CTI has the expertise in this, to get this particular grant, we're the leader. If it's CBA, then it's CBA. If it's the school department, then it's the school department, and we become supportive. So I think that the partnerships, the building of trust, people doing their specialty, I think that's, that's been a, a, a tremendous change that I've seen. The growth has been tremendous, but what I've found, we live by our strategic plan. So every three years, we do a comprehensive community needs assessment to find out what the communities need, and then we do our strategic plan from that. And it's my job, and certainly our board's job, to drive the strategic plan and to make sure that we're following our goals and the strategies that we have to implement those goals. I find because we are faithful and really driven by our mission and by our goals, that we've grown incrementally, and it really helps us to do it in a sustainable and thoughtful way. Um, because growth can be scary. I mean, we grew a lot this year. I think we added 100 staff, basically um, due to our work in the homeless arena, both with homeless families and homeless individuals. So 
when you do that, you have to have the infrastructure to support it. And we spend a lot of time making sure that we know from year to year what are the positions we need in order to support the work we do. So, you know, we think a lot about our frontline staff, and we've worked really hard to increase salaries um, to make them have wages that they can afford to live in this community. So we do a lot of work on equity um, for our staff as well as for the community. Over the years, we're up to about 600 staff. We're in 70 communities, um, and we serve about 55,000 people every year. And I think about what if community action was not in our communities, you know? For families, we help them get healthy food through the WIC program, which is a nutrition and health program for women, infants, and children. Uh, our seniors, we have senior volunteers who work with us. Um, we educate about 1,200 kids every day in Head Start, early Head Start in child care and after school programming. Um, we help businesses get started. And I think the significant changes, you know, that we help our community is to give people, to get people to become contributing members of community who can live, uh, work, pay taxes, and be participating uh, in their communities. And I think that's really the wonderful thing that I see happen with so many people. They come in in our programs. We have lots of people who've been in our programs who work with us. Um, who become staff members, who've gone to college, who've gone to graduate school. And to me, that's really what it's all about. And that it's so wonderful to see people flourishing in their lives. We have a very strong management team. Um, we have systems in place, a strategic plan in place that will help guide us. And one of the things we know is that we can't um, reduce poverty without addressing racism. And that will be and is a huge part of our work. Um, if we look at, you know, graduation rates, if we look at, you know, um, the income, if we look at wealth that people have, we all know that there are disparities. There are huge disparities and much due to racial inequity. Going forward, that is something we will continue to be involved with. In the last year, we've been bringing out a film to the various communities we work in. It's called Who We Are, A Chronicle of Racism in America. And it's to educate, it's to help people understand the history and why things are the way they are and why they need to be changed. If you think about zoning issues, why zoning came from uh, some of it, a very racist past, so that people of color could not live in communities. Um, if you think about housing, where people could live. Uh, if you think about education, still, uh, still uh, huge disparities in achievement rates uh, for uh, various populations. So I think going forward, that certainly will be a big part of the work we continue to do um, in order to address and provide opportunities for everyone, which is our mission, to provide equal opportunities and access to housing and all of the, uh, the wealth growth opportunities that people should have. You know, you think about people who have been not able to buy homes, um, and that's how you build equity. And so we want to make sure that everybody has the opportunity to do that. I think that, um one of the things that we have accomplished is to have low-income people feel better about themselves by being able to participate in their own future and finding programs, you know, have a, a say in the programs that, that will help them. Um, and so I think from that point of view, the agency has been a great success because we have a lot of experience examples of people who came through, who didn't have much when they started, and now have good jobs, and now have good housing, and now have good services. The fact that we made 60 years is amazing. Absolutely amazing. Yeah. And all the good that has been done and all the help people have received over those 60 years. It's just, it's just unbelievable, really. The marvelous program. I think you can tell that I'm very proud that I have this very long commitment with CTI. 
I think it's it's the way I was raised to, to be. I'm a community activist. That's that's what I. If you ask me what I am, that's what I say I am. I used to say I'm a volunteer, but I'm more than that. I am an activist. I'm proactive, and it was the way I was raised, and um, it's the way I live my life. And um, community teamwork gives me the opportunity, you know, to do some to do some good.